Hiya. Okay, so video three of the final key area of unit two, and we're on to obesity. So previous two videos, one on blood glucose, one on diabetes, effectively, and the final video is looking at obesity. So obesity is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease and type two diabetes. This is a thing you should know from life, but it's also a thing that the higher human course wants you to know. Um, the stuff in the box is not essential, but it can also cause associated joint and muscle problems as people with increased weight will put more strain on those areas. Uh, it's also been linked to mental health disorders, including anxiety and depression. So both they can be a cause of obesity, but also the people who have obesity can also uh, be linked to these mental health disorders as well, depending on the individual and their circumstances. Now, obesity is characterized by excess body fat in relation to muscle tissue in a standard person. We'll get into the limitations of uh, BMI uh, in a second. So it's usually characterized by a high fat, or it's usually caused, sorry, by high fat sugar diet and a lack of exercise. There are some genetic factors that can cause or contribute to obesity as well. Uh, body mass index, so BMI, can give a measurable indication of the excess body fat that a person may be carrying. But again, there are terms and conditions attached to that, is that BMI does have some limitations and these limitations you do need to be aware of. Okay, so BMI, this is a formula you have to have memorized. So I think there are two formula, formulae uh, during the entire of higher human that you need to know in your head. And one is cardiac output. So CO equals SV times HR. And this is the other one. So BMI equals your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters, but that height is squared. Okay, now the conversion of these units is a skill that the SQA just expects you to be able to do. So they would expect that they can hand you a person's weight in grams and you can just convert it to kilograms and they expect that you can hand, they can hand you their height in centimeters and you can just convert it to, to meters. Okay. If you struggle with that skill, ask your teacher, ask your math teacher for practice problems on that area, but it's one that you are expected to be able to do at this stage. A number to know, because you don't need to know enough numbers, is uh, a BMI greater than 30 indicates obesity. So that is a number that you need to know and you might get tested on. So you have to be able to use this formula. You have to be able to use this formula to calculate somebody's BMI. So they give you their weight and height. But you might also get asked to calculate their height based given if you are given their body mass and weight. Uh, you might also get asked a much harder type of skill, which is how much weight does this person have to lose in order to be a normal BMI or how much weight do they have to gain in order to be a normal BMI? Now, those questions are significantly more difficult. Again, make sure you get practice questions from your teacher in order to practice that skill because it's, it's quite an important one. Now, you might get provided in exam situations if they're being nice to you with a nice table like this, but you'd have to extract specific data from it. Again, the only number that you need to know is a BMI of greater than 30. So we can assume anybody under a BMI of 30, we're going to call normal weight or, you know, we'll call them normal weight. Um, and then they should specify if a BMI is underweight or indicating of underweight. But we can see this is an actual chart of how BMI classifications actually work. So if you've got a BMI of less than 18.5, you're considered to be underweight at that stage. If you're considered, if you're between 18.5 and 24.9, then you are in that normal range uh, of BMI and you've got your average associated health risks. As soon as you stray into the overweight category, so a BMI of greater than 25.0, is you're into increased uh, rates of um, associated health risks, like uh, increased risk of type 2 diabetes, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, and those risks increase the higher your BMI gets after that point. Now, it's not an exact science BMI, but it is a very useful tool for doctors to give a, a kind of at least an indication for them to say that there might be an issue here with somebody's weight and the contributory factors that this will have on their health. Now, here's the limitations. BMI is a ratio of height to mass. So a person carrying extra flesh effectively will be classified as overweight or obese. But there are some really muscly people out there. OK, so people with a high muscle mass might get quantified as a 
overweight or obese person, even though they are not. They've just got quite a high muscle mass. So weightlifters, certain types of rugby players, depending on their position and their body build, they can be classified as obese according to the BMI situation. But obviously a doctor would be able to look at that person and say, well, you're not obese, you're just a very muscly person. Now, you can reduce obesity by reducing your fat levels through proper diet and exercise. This is a thing you should already know from life. Um, to lose body weight, a diet that is low in fat and simple sugars should be followed. Now, this is the kind of science bit behind this that for higher human, you do need to know. Fats have a really high energy content to be used up and then tend to be stored for later. So this is why you should follow a low fat diet, because fats have high energy and get stored. Simple sugars require almost no energy to digest, as in you don't have to pile loads of enzymes on them, wait loads of time in order for bonds to be broken. They, they absorb really, really quickly into the bloodstream. And then as a result, again, you need to do more energetic activities to get rid of the simple sugars that you have eaten into your body. OK, so I have seen exam questions that ask about basically why should a low fat diet be followed? Why should a simple sugars be avoided? And these are the reasons that you need to quote uh, back to them in an exam situation. Exercise, again, exercise is a cure for all things in the universe. OK, it reduces obesity and complications from obesity by number one, expending energy, increasing energy expenditure. So. The aim to lose weight is you've got to use more energy than you eat in that particular day. So the idea is you use more energy by moving. It also builds and preserves lean muscle tissue. Lean muscle tissue has a higher energy demand on it than, say, fat cells that are just sitting around. Reducing stress is a big factor because that helps to uh, increase things like vasodilation around your body. Uh, it reduces your risk of high blood pressure as well, which, as we know, leads to cardiovascular disease. And remember, it improves your HDL to LDL ratio, so that HDL increases in its number, meaning that it carts away more cholesterol out of your bloodstream, which again, reduces your risk of atherosclerosis. And then reducing hypertension. Blood uh, pressure does seem to be reduced by the after effects of exercise. So to summarize for obesity, obesity is a BMI greater than 30. BMI is a measurement of body mass to height ratio. It's got limitations if the person is very muscly. That word muscly looks wrong, written down. And diet and exercise are ways to maintain a healthy BMI. And really, there should be the formula on this last slide. So BMI equals your weight in kilograms divided by your height squared. And that's a formula that you do need to know. And that is it. That is the end of unit two. You are now two thirds of the way through this course. Give yourself a massive pat on the back. There is an enormous amount in this. Some of you might be coming up for your prelims very soon. So what you want to be doing is maybe trying the first two thirds of whole exam papers by now. They tend to come in order. So it tends to be unit one questions, then unit two, then unit three. Obviously, you won't have done unit three yet. So you should be able to do about the first two thirds of an exam paper. And that's a good idea for just trying to identify any areas of weakness that you might have, practicing your problem solving skills and just generally seeing how you might perform in an exam situation. Uh, there's going to take about a three week break or so, and then we'll be posting the videos on neurobiology and immunology unit three, starting with the nervous system, as far as I'm aware. OK, and we will see you in the new year.